So the first question was, can words save the world? No. No, the answer is no. Um, and before you all get grumpy and side with Batman, I'll, I'll tell you why I say no. And there's several reasons. The first is that one would have to have an extraordinarily grand sense of self to believe that that were true. The idea is not only flawed, but it's arrogant. To think that one group of people or one set of actions alone can save the world or can save anything is mistaken. And it's mistaken because the truth of the world and the secret of the universe and things that we keep hearing at One Young World today, what we kept hearing last year, is this, is that we are all connected. Everything is connected. Everything is connected and every one of us is connected. The idea is wrong and I say no as well because it's dangerous. And it's dangerous because who decides which words help save the world and who decides which words hurt the world. Um, and the best example I can give you of why it's dangerous is uh, Radovan Karadzic. You all are obviously aware um, that as we sit here today, Karadzic, the architect of the Bosnian War, a war that killed, I think conservative estimates say 100,000 people, is currently standing trial at The Hague for an assortment of crimes. And those crimes include um, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, genocide, that sort of thing. But what you may not know, and actually what I hope you don't know, is that Karadzic is also a most prolific author. He has published six volumes of poetry, that's six books of poetry. Um, he's written countless, countless poems. Uh, they're, they're available online. I don't recommend at all that you read any of them. But I can tell you this. Randovan Karadzic thinks that his writing is saving the world. When Karadzic writes, he writes to save the world. He writes with the belief that his words are saving the world. So to answer Batman, please don't write to save the world. Write to break barriers, write to destroy boundaries, write to push for peace, write to spread compassion, but don't write to save the world. And I've sort of been wanting to say this for a while as well. I think it's connected. What, what, what do, you, do you call yourself one young worlders or one young worldies or one young worldians? Oh, that's much nicer. <laughs> okay, so, so one young world ambassadors, if, if, if we can say something to you, I, I feel like I should say this. Don't be the UN. Please don't be the United Nations. Because, oh good, I'm very, I'm very pleased. Everyone's looking at me grumpily. But don't be the United Nations because the United Nations exists supposedly to save the world and all it does is sanction war and protect the strong against the weak. So don't be them, but be what Bob said last night. Um, make hives, become hives. Everything is connected. And, and the sooner that all of us realize that and understand that and live and act with that mantra, then I think, yeah, we have a chance of saving something. The, the second question that Batman had was about me. But I think in the current scheme of things, it would be sort of obscene to talk about myself. When we all met last night, when One Young World kicked off yesterday evening, Kate said to us that there's one name that should be on our minds and one name that should be on our mouths and everywhere with us this week. And that's Malala, Malala Yousafzai. And I think I'd rather answer that question by talking about her. And if you were here in the morning, have all of you been here since eight in the morning? That's amazing. So, <laughs> so yes, big, big cheer. Um, so you were here in the morning, and we, we spoke about it briefly, and I talked to you a tiny bit about context. And I want to talk a little more about that context. Um, to do that, I've got to jump you back five years and take you to about 2007. 
It was about that time that the Pakistani Taliban began their takeover of the Swat Valley. So about five years ago, they kicked out polio eradication campaigns from the valley. They burnt down schools. They cut access to cable television. And they changed radio broadcasts, which they believed were un-Islamic, to only push for one agenda. This was a slow process. This was a long process. It didn't come out of thin air. It was not a surprise. And all the while that it was happening, the Pakistani state did nothing. I mean, actively it did nothing. So it did not insist on polio eradication drives. It did not rebuild schools that had been burnt down. It did not demand that broadcasters present balanced information to audiences. It did nothing. And in 2009, the Taliban declared their final intention, and they demanded that Sharia law be imposed in the Swat Valley. To that, the Pakistani state said, well, of course, sure, uh, whatever you'd like. And the National Assembly in 2009, the very same National Assembly that is currently sitting, drafted a bill. They drafted a bill to institute Sharia law in the Swat Valley, and they called the bill, this is the Pakistani state's wording, the order of justice. They drafted the bill, and the president, again, the very same president that sits there right now, signed that bill into law on April, April 13th, I think, 2009. Not only they signed it into law, uh, but they had it start retroactively. A couple months later, the state changed its mind and it went to war. And it's this point in time that a seventh grade girl, only 11 years old at the time, begins to write a blog for the BBC. Have you read Malala's diary? Have many of you read? So Malala wrote, and she wrote about the nightmare of military helicopters constantly flying overhead. She wrote about girls dropping out of schools. And the girls who stayed, she wrote about how they came to school dressed in their normal clothes and not in their uniform so that they wouldn't be targeted. And Malala wrote under a pen name. She called herself Gul Makai, which she said she liked a lot more than her real name, Malala, which means grief-stricken. Context. Uh, the week after Malala was shot, 16 Pakistanis were killed by an unmanned predator drone strike. That violence uh, came at the hand of fundamentalists too. Different fundamentalists, but fundamentalists all the same. This week, while we've all been here together in Pittsburgh, three children in Afghanistan were killed by a NATO artillery strike. Tragic, said NATO after the killing, but NATO answered the killing of three children with a bat. And I think the point I'm trying to make here is the same that I made a minute ago. Everything is connected. Malala shooting those 16 deaths by drone strike, those three children killed in the artillery strike. There's no difference. When you sanction violence, you cannot decide who uses it. When you employ violence, you cannot restrict others from using it. Violence is unacceptable, no matter who the perpetrator is. And, and if, I, if I can end, um, I, I want to end with something Malala herself said. She did, um, she did a CNN interview in 2011, which you may have seen. And if, if you haven't seen it, please go home and, and YouTube it. Um, the interview is extraordinary, not only because the interviewer asks like, ridiculous questions, but as ridiculous as his questions were, Malala's answers were clear and eloquent and brave. And he asks her at some point what she would say to all the other girls. What would she say to all the other 14-year-olds who are scared and who just want to stay home and lock the door and not think about it? This, I think, should be the answer to this to Batman's question. Malala said without missing a beat, she said that she would tell them, don't be afraid. Your people are being blown up. Stand up for their rights. So let's end with Malala. Thank you. Thank you.